wrestling fans around the corner and around the world. I'm Dan Marotti. Gerald Briscoe here. Unbelievable. Another brand new episode of Wrestling Inside, a special edition is now. I've known Pat since I was a you know, young man in this business, and I never knew Pat to get out of line in this business in, in my entire career. And I, you know, I never saw any, uh, I mean, even when I was around when all this stuff was supposed to be taking place, either I was the blindest SOB <laughs> in the world, or I just didn't give a crap, but I give a crap about humanity, so I think I would have picked up on some of this stuff. And I think, I know, I don't think, I know I would have said something to somebody. But. Yo, 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 wrestling fans, this Sunday, July the 25th, JTG joins us in MWF Studios in Melrose, Massachusetts for a series of Wrestling Insider tapings and live cyber autograph signing. Want to join us in studio live with JTG? Join the Boston Wrestling Patreon family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling or pre-order your photo. JTG will autograph and personalize live on the air and give you a shout out at bostonwrestling.com. Russell fans around the corner around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Johnny, the fans just haven't asked for it, they have demanded it. This August, we're headed back to Tampa for Russell House 2. WrestleMania weekend, we brought you Sinister Minister James Mitchell, TJP, Demolition Smash, Al Snow, Dutch Mantel Zeb Coulter, JTG of Crime Time, and WWE Hall of Famer Gerald Briscoe for in-depth interviews and live interactive cyber autograph signings. And if you want our Wednesday Night Wrestling Insider Special edition episodes to continue, we need your help to bring these superstars' careers and lives to life. Bringing you free content seven days each week is an expensive proposition between appearance fees, air travel, renting the house, the equipment, and everything that goes in to a week of shooting. We can't do it without you. As we prepare to return to producing live and ring events, help us bring you the superstars and legends of yesterday and tomorrow by visiting Indiegogo now and check out some of the great rewards. Wrestling fans, it's going to be a wild week in Tampa the first week in August. Get ready for Wrestle House 2. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans, welcome back to another episode of Wrestling Insider Special Edition. Very happy to have Jerry Briscoe back with me. We got a great response to our first episode where we talk some current events, everything you have going on right now. You're very active with the Briscoe and Bradshaw show with our buddy John Bradshaw Layfield, a guy I think an awful lot of, despite what some may say out there in internet lore that your show keeps getting more popular and popular. So I feel honored to have you here on our Wrestle House excursion here, as opposed to being back in uh, cold Boston, probably even when this is. Well, it, it, it's a pleasure to be on your show, Dan, and it's also a pleasure to be on your show in Tampa, Florida. You'd rather I mean, be here than Boston. Yeah, I mean, look <laughs> out there. there. There's the Gulf of Mexico. The waves are rolling in. They're, they're beautiful, beautiful makings of a great sunset coming up here in Tampa, Florida. And if you've never seen a sunset here on the Gulf of Mexico on that beautiful white sand beach, then how did you afford? Was it? My being on your show that you were able to afford this damn suite here. I think this it was palatial Ma suite. I think it was Marty's murder confession, but I don't know. Oh, I may. I, I mean, when you, when you look that up Tony Atlas, he's not here, so you're probably saving money from uh, uh, feeding that damn Tony Atlas. Fifty-five dollars. Yeah. I mean, look out that beautiful bay window. Is that not? Oh my! Is that goodness. not a view? Dad, that's the only reason I agreed to spend two hours out on this show was so I could look at the view. Look at the view, yeah. I'm you looking can... at the view. You're looking over at a damn white wall. Over there. I'm look looking at the white wall. And we got our friend bad. over there, Dave Cotter, our longtime associate. We got Glantz over here. We got Vicente Ray and his breasts, someone that uh, you had helped at one of the seminars you came up for. Right? He had a, an unfortunate experience during one of these interviews that we did with the Superstars WrestleMania weekend. It was exposed that beyond having a little 
extra here. He has uh, his own personal Mr. Sarko that's permanently attached to him downstairs, if you know what I mean. He can't pull it out like Mick, you know what I mean? He's kind of, that's what the mother and father decided. He's got his own Sarko and protection system down there. A fortunate man. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, as we continue our great series of interviews with you, my big thing is... I love how WWE produces their documentaries, their different series they have on the network. Uh, as far as history goes, they bought all the libraries they bought. They can present it any way they want to. But sometimes they're not as in-depth about particular events, particular people. Sometimes uh, folks that weren't main eventers, they kind of get forgotten. And, you know, they contributed an awful lot to the sport, even if they weren't the marquee, so to speak. So when we do these series, I like to look at sometimes particular events, particular years. And to me, uh, I was a little guy when I started watching in 1986. But even looking back at it now, I think the best roster that WWF ever had was 1989. If you look at the grouping they had from January 31st to December 31st of that year as the decade ended, some came, some went. But if you look at overall... Who was on that roster in that year? I would debate just about anybody on it. So that's kind of the timeline I wanted to look at with you today. Uh, 1988 was a hot year. You had Macho Man Randy Savage storming into 1989 as the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion. You had the Ultimate Warrior, uh, maybe the Goldberg of his generation as the Intercontinental Champion. He crushed Honky Tonk Man and ended his... Uh, historic reign as champion, and you had two guys who I think the world of absolutely love, Bill Eady, Barry Dasso, Axe and Smash Demolition as the tag team champions. Those are some loaded guns to begin a new year in any company. I tell you, Dan, uh, 1989 is just really a memorable year with, with that talent, but you know, it, it and you, I'm glad you made the decision to go with 1989 because if you would have asked me, I would probably come up with another year. Mm -hmm. And you asked another person down there, I'm sure they'd come up with another year. We all had our favorite years, and 89 was special. Just to, you know that warrior magic. Was I a great warrior fan? No. Was I a great warrior person? No. But was I a great admirer of what this guy was able to do in the ring and the, the transformation that he would bring to the audience when he ran out to the ring and got into the ring? I was a super fan just like everybody else. So I just so you don't have to be a fan of, of the person. Just let yourself go and be a fan of that character. And if you become a fan of the character, you let all that other minor stuff go, and you just sit back and you enjoy the show. And that was what I was able to do with with the uh, with the warrior, and uh, and and I I enjoyed his performances, but he was a difficult man to do business with. I mean, I'm not gonna lie to anybody. You know, he's a difficult man. Well, we will talk more about Warrior as time goes on, but just as the year began, look at the house show loops that you had. On one loop, you had Hogan and Boss Man, which was doing huge business everywhere. On another loop, you had Macho Man Randy Savage as the world champion. Instead of, uh, you, instead of having Hogan as number one, he's almost 1A. He's in a pretty hot feud with Bad News Brown. Bad News made uh, some comments to Jack Tunney on the Brother Love show that maybe... Elizabeth was doing a little bit of filleting to try and get Randy the position. It was alluded to on that. So that was a pretty hot feud. The fans wanted to see Ho uh, Randy get their hands on bad news. Then on the C team, you have Warrior defending the Intercontinental Championship. Jake was involved in a hot feud with Andre at the time. I mean, all three tours were just absolutely loaded with talent. You know, you know that that's something you, you just just think of, of the the uh, enormity of what you just said. Three towns running a night with three major sets of superstars in each one of those towns, and it was such a such a contest and such a pride thing. Well, town A, we did this much. 
Well, town B is supposed to be a lesser car, but we outdo town A. Well, town C, which is like the, the third card, we outdo them all. So there was that competition among the talent. They knew where they were going to be seated. They knew where, where which level they were going to be. And there was so much pride when that C town outdrew the A town, which happened many, many times. And, and we weren't in the... Uh, the Madison Square Garden. Right. We might yeah. have been in, a, you know, a lesser over across the river or something like that. But but we were still able to to outdraw the main towns, and that the guys took so much pride in doing that. That's what made it so enjoyable to be around all those personalities. It it was just an unbelievable time in the period. I mean, and not just that. I thought NWA had a really solid year in 1989, too, with some of the great feuds with Flair and Steamboat, Flair and Funk. You know, it was a night, even though the territories were dying off at that pace, for the promotions that you could watch, I mean, it, it was just absolutely fantastic. There there were diff, different uh, eras for different, different organizations, but when both organizations are, are peaking at the same time, the the winner out out of that is is the fan like right the at people home. sitting at home watching that because they're getting to see the best of the best in every organization, and that's what makes it so good when when you have two organizations peaking at the same time or starting to peak at the same time, because the runoff. I mean. Did we hear what was going on down south? Damn right. And I'm sure the people down south heard what was going on with us up north there. And there was always that competition. And I tell you that the, the, the big boss that's sitting ahead of the table, and I'm talk, not talking Ray Trader, I'm talking Vince <laughs> McMahon. He said, don't worry about what they're doing down there. We're not going to do that. We're going to worry about what we're doing up here and build our product where we don't have to worry about what they're doing down south. And he was able to keep us focused, keep our mind on what we were doing instead of what the other people were doing. And his prophecy came true as we started building and started creating that gap, and that gap kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As noted many times by the individual, Bad News Brown, Alan Coage, uh, he had stated that uh, Vince McMahon had promised he was going to be the first black world champion in the WWF. With what you saw with what Bad News had to offer in that time period, 88, 89, do you think he would have made a credible world champion compared to what was on the roster at the time? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I, I'd heard that Allen had claimed that, and mm. I, but I had never heard that promise myself mm -hmm. delivered to anybody or, or anybody in that upper, I guess it's Vince's upper upper circle uh, group of people. I never never heard anybody say that. But do I think he could have been a great champion? The guy was believable in everything he did. He had a background. He was an Olympian. He was a world team medalist. I mean, he was the guy. The guy was a legit badass and a, a legit guy that. Now, believe me, as skilled as I thought I was, I don't think I would have wanted to piss him off. Really? Because I, I think he was, he, was, he, was, he was the real deal. So do I think he could have handled the, the, uh, the enormity of, of carrying that, uh, the WWF organization? Yes, I do, because really? he had that much skill. I didn't know if he had that much ability to, to, to step out of and and like a Hogan or a Macho Man or, or or a Warrior, to be able to elevate somebody else as much as they did because of the entertainment aspect. And all the time, the tough guys come in and they're not able. They're able to to take care of themselves and they're able to build that image that they're the best. But are they able to take a guy and to bring him up to their own level? That might have been the stumbling block why he, why that promise was never fulfilled, if that promise was ever made. He was good at being bad news brown, Ooh, but could yeah. he elevate people up the ladder, maybe exactly. was the question. Interesting. The first big event of 1989, it was a television taping right here in the Sunshine State, Tampa, Florida. Uh, the first Saturday night's main event, which for fans, if they were not around for that era, if they've missed them, 
on WWE Network, even though they weren't a regular series, those uh, every four to six weeks, Saturday Night Live was interrupted by WWF Wrestling. Great 90-minute specials from 11.30 to 1 a.m. And the ratings that they draw were astronomical, astronomical on par with Saturday Night's main event, or they never would have got the spot. But the first Saturday Night's main event in 1989 uh, it's uh, interesting, the Red Rooster, Terry Taylor, uh, I don't know if that was uh, a, a little bit of a joke on the man with his clocky attitude I've been told about over the years. I've always had nice interactions with Terry, but the Rooster turned on the brain, he had enough, and that led to the push for the very first time of an enhancement talent in Steve Lombardi, who went from being a, a, a jobber enhancement guy to becoming a, a lower level Superstar as the Brooklyn Brawler being paired with Bobby Heenan for the first time. Any memories of uh, Lombardi getting a push and Terry Taylor as a rooster? Well, bring me back to that, but let, let, let me take you to the beginning of the oh, segment. Sure. Uh, the uh, Saturday night's main event. Now, when I first came to WWE, a lot of people don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've had so many different positions with the WWE. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. I never had an official. I had one official title that, that we'll talk about at some time. But when I, when I, when I first came to uh, WWE, I came as a promoter. Mm -hmm. uh, from 1986 to uh, 1992 or three, maybe, 1993, I did the local promotion. Now, at that time, the WWF was WWE. How what do we say? WWF WWE was just starting to to uh, come and filtrate the South. They had a very difficult time with the low low building managers and the, and the local promoters because these a lot of these promoters were delivering shows to these buildings fifty two weeks out of the right. year. So for me to go to them when, when I got the phone call because they were having so much difficulty getting in, and me uh, as, as an owner and as a talent, I mean, always made sure that even when I was a talent, when I owned part of the territory, and, and Mr. Crockett Sr. in the Carolinas when I first came in because I was a college boy and I was different than the ordinary talent that he had in there at the time. And I was an athlete. And so Mr. Crockett always took me around. And every building we'd go into, especially the bigger building, Mr. Crockett would always make a point of introducing me to the building manager. And I'd have a conversation with him about business, you know, about different events coming in. Because I was interested in that stuff. I always wanted to be on that side of the fence. So I figured if they... A guy like Jim Crockett Sr. is giving you this open door. And not only through Crockett Sr., but when I went to Atlanta, Georgia, Jim Barnett and Eddie Graham here in Florida would do the same thing. So I made a lot of a lot of contacts with the building well, with the building people. So as I said, WWE was having trouble getting their foot in the door because of these other promoters. But the other promoters now, had, by the time we get to the late 80s, they're, they've cut down their events. They're not running 52 weeks of the year. Right. They're running 27. Some of them are running 12. Some of them are running 6 or 8. So I'd come in, and I had a great working relationship. Ed Cohen was our director That's of events. That's who broke me in with WWE was Ed Cohen. Our, our good I love Ed Cohen. Yes, I think it's Sally worth saying. Pursuto were instrumental in teaching me how to promote the, the business mm -hmm. so I, I got a relationship with them because I got I was down here I wasn't doing nothing I'd made my cell I'd finished my time up in uh, in uh, in the uh, in the Carolinas we'd made our cell events we'd made that little short stand and run with uh, with Murdoch and Adonis that we we got over like a million bucks in to surprise a lot of people I think we'd made that run my brother decided hey, I'm finished I want to retire so it quit so I was kind of in between wondering what the hell am I going to do because I'm real young and I don't want to settle my ass the rest yeah, you would have been what at that point your early 30s yeah mid 30s or, or late 30s yeah I just didn't want to sit on my butt for the rest of my life. And even though I financially probably could have done it. So I got a phone call one day. It was uh, Vince McMahon and Jim Barnett. 
And uh, Jim got on the phone first. And he, you know, Vince called me, so I would take the call because I probably wouldn't have taken the call if it had been Jim. <laughs> so Vince made the call. And, hey, you know, we're coming up with some stuff. Where you know, you explained to him the fact that they're having a few issues getting into a lot of building down here. And he said, uh, "I got Jim Barnett on there. He wants to talk to you." And Jim Barnett, when I was a rookie in Australia. It was kind of funny because if you think back on one of our earlier shows, I told you I drove the ring truck around, so I learned a lot about the business before I got into the business. Mm -hmm. I went to Australia as a, as a rookie, and I was over there with so many MSG, Madison Square Garden stars, and big, big, huge stars. Well, Jim Barnett really liked my work and really liked my 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 thinking towards the business. And I started, uh, even at, as a rookie, getting involved a little bit in the booking part of it there. And Jim, I read, I always uh, Jerry, you, your future is going to be in the, in the office in this in this business. And I, yeah, sure. I they be, know I you had a, a good mind for the business. Yeah, I want to be a star first. <laughs> you know, that's all I wanted to be. I didn't care about it. But I'd always had that, you know, the, when, when they call, I always had that. I wanted to get in the business side of this business there. So uh, uh, I, I agreed uh, to go to work as a promoter. And at that time, I was, they couldn't get into Orlando. They couldn't get into Miami. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They were in Miami, but they couldn't get into Tampa where we're talking about this show. And they couldn't, couldn't even budge Carolina or Georgia. And I had a great relationship. So I went to work, and I ended up opening... Not only all of Florida with them, but I had nine other states. I ended up with nine states I was promoting for 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 the office there. And she so were one of Ed's assassins for a while. Yeah, well, yeah. Ed 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 trusted me so much. I love Ed Cohen. That I miss Ed him. Ed eventually let me. Okay, here's here's the group of days that you have. Fill them. I would be uh, tasked with a, a filling the dates and making a, a suitable. Loop, track yeah. like a loop where we could be coordinated and it wouldn't be crisscrossing all over the damn place and negotiate the building deals. So they had that much trust into me. So, well, okay, to back up to your question now, Saturday night main event. So I got us in the Sun Dome here. Championship Wrestling in Florida was running all their events out of the Sun Dome there. So I went to, and as a matter of fact, I had lunch. It was kind of funny because that's where Raw is and all the TV is going to start their back over at the Sundome, which I had lunch just two or three days ago with the ex building manager down there, really? there that now retired. We're kind of laughing. Yeah, they're back to what we started, you know, uh, 30 years ago. And he actually pulled up the card, pulled up the, the gross, the attendance, and everything for the card. So our first event was Saturday night main event. Dick Embersall. Uh, Lou, uh, what, uh, uh, Michaels, uh, uh, Lord Michaels, Michaels yeah, Saturday Night the Live, creator yeah. of Saturday Night Main Event. They were here, and I was getting to me. You know, I'm a huge Saturday Night Main, uh, Saturday Night Live fan. You know, here I'm getting to work with Lou Del Pratt, all these big name producer TV names, not the stars, uh, but the producer names who are the, the important people of the damn thing. Put the damn thing together. They're coming to my city, and they're, I'm getting to sit down at a table and have uh, have uh, uh, strategy meetings with these executives. Like I'm, I was just, I'm just beside myself. And so we had the first event here, and of course we went on sale. And I remember we were going back. I was taking them back to the airport. And a friend of mine, Bubba the Love Sponge, called me, and I oh. tell him who I got in my car with. He said, hey, you think they'd mind calling me in 10 minutes? I'm going back on the air. I'd love to get them on and we'd hit a plug for the show. Are they here? And then, sure. So hung up by the time we get to the airport at time. Uh, uh, Michael picks up the phone. We call and he called Bubba. And I had all three of them on, on, on Bubba the Love Sponge show. Boom, just like that. Boy, they were impressed. They went back to Vince. But man, that brisket water promoter, you know, he, Immediately, he had us on all the big drive time shows. I wow. just got lucky that yeah. day, you know. But, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, we had the first one here. It was such a special event, having those producers here in this town and uh, and seeing what kind of product. But that that ended that that product every once every month. It would end up out drawing the uh, Saturday Night Live. It was shows. huge. 
I don't think people that weren't fans of that era realized how big Saturday night's main event was because it was a, a commodity to be able to see, you know, superstar versus superstar as opposed to the typical syndicated shows that were usually enhancement matches and interview segments to try and get you to go to the town or to buy the pay-per-view. Uh, right now I'm here in the queue from the back, folks. We're going to take a brief time out. We're going to continue to look at that Saturday night's main event that kicked off 1989. Stand by. The World Wrestling Federation was live at Singapore Indoor Stadium in Kalang, Singapore, Thursday, July the 21st, 1994. In the opening contest, Quang beat the 1-2-3 kid. Bushwhacker Luke and Coco Beware with the win over Barry Horowitz and Reno Riggins. Model Rick Martel defeated Jim Powers. The Undertaker, victorious over Yokozuna via disqualification. Native American Tatanka beat the Barbarian. WWF Tag Team Champions, the Head Shrinkers, retained the titles over Well Done. And in the main event, WWF World Champion Bret Hitman Hart retained the title over Owen Hart. If you are in Kolang Live, share your memories in the comments section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working in our eBay store and on our world-renowned Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Boston Wrestling Sports and the MWF explodes into a new year with professional wrestling content galore and need you to join our family. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after our Monday Night Raw review, it's Wrestling Insiders at your house with WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. after NXT and AEW, join rotating legends on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday night after SmackDown, don't miss John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, history videos, bonus live episodes, pay per view, watch alongs, and more. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, get early ad free access to our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times. WWE is coming home to Kansas City with Monday Night Raw. WWE is back with Monday Night Raw in Kansas City, Monday, July 26th. Tickets on sale now. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm Mr. USA WWE Hall of Famer, Tony Atlas. The road to WrestleMania has begun. Wrestling fans are looking to add to their man caves. You gotta see what we have in the eBay store. Check it out. Support Wrestling Insiders in studio shoot interviews on eBay with this brand new personally autographed WWE Royal Rumble 2021 11 by 14 poster signed by WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns, his advocate Paul Heyman and Kevin Owens. Reigns and Owens battled for the Universal title in a last standing match January 31st in the Thunderdome in Tampa. This limited edition collector's poster is number 31 of only 50 produced. Comes with WWE authentication hologram on the poster itself. Also comes with an on-air shout-out from WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas and a bonus autographed 8x10 photo. Get this rare, awesome collectible for your man cave and help keep wrestling legends working now. Wrestling fans, especially here in the Boston area, we want to thank our great friends at Red Rose for their support for all of our charitable endeavors and programming efforts. Red Rose is two years young and extremely thankful for all the support they've had from our neighbors here in Melrose and beyond for an amazing first two years. Red Rose thanks Melrose and all of the first responders who have fought the good fight and have never given up hope during these unprecedented times. We did it together. Follow Red Rose on Facebook for their anniversary special, facebook.com backslash Red Rose Melrose. You'll be glad you did. Open until 2 a.m. Red Rose will give you fresh, piping hot, mouth-watering food that'll put an ear-to-ear -ear smile on even the toughest critic's face. Check out their full menu online 
at redrosema.com or give them a call, 781-620-1889. All right, wrestling fans, welcome back. Jerry's having a sip of that uh, soft drink there. We don't want to give them too cheap of a plug unless they want to sponsor the show. But as we were discussing, the first Saturday night's main event, 1989, in this beautiful city, Tampa, Florida, I, again, talk promoted about promoted by Gerald Briscoe. Promoted by Gerald Briscoe. These crazy names, when you look back at them, you had a rooster turn on a brain, which <laughs> led to the Brains Association with a Brooklyn brawler. You have memories of Terry Taylor as the rooster, and all of a sudden, Steve Lombardi, after four or five years, getting a little bit of a chance at a push. Uh, you know, the Terry Taylor as the rooster. I mean, I you know. I never quite figured out that that gimmick, and I don't think Terry <laughs> ever figured it out. But uh, uh, but uh, you know, I knew Terry when Terry was, you know, just a snot nosed kid, just carrying around a book, learning wrestling moves. He started here in Florida. He was from over Vero Beach, over over on the other side of, of, of the state there, but. He literally carried around a how-to wrestling book and would sit in the dressing rooms in front of all his peers reading out of a play of how to be a wrestler. And he did a damn good job at it. Terry was a good, good performer in the ring. And uh, and uh, and he, he, he became the Red Rooster, but uh, the brain, the Bobby the brain had. Oh, I mean, another what great a dear one. man. I mean, the, the brings a tear to every fan die. You just mentioned Bobby the brain. And uh, how much can a guy be respected in this business by his peers? How and many I, call him the greatest manager of all time? And I, you know I love Percy, but how many call Bobby the greatest of all time? Hey, you could easily call him the greatest of all time and be correct. And you'd be you'd probably have to fight some people if you didn't call him the greatest of all time. But he he's definitely on that goat list. And that that's you know the goat. He's the goat. I mean, every every era has their goat. There's not just one goat and 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 anything. I mean there's the greatest of all time, but you know you can't put the greatest of all. Mickey Mantle was a goat, but it was he is the greatest. Some of these guys different there. eras, right? But uh, you know, call your scrimps. He was a goat. You know? Hey, now you're talking <laughs> all <laughs> yes, <laughs> the yes man. But uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan, if there ever was a damn goat, you're it. I'll say this: I, I think to take a guy like Steve Lombardi, that was known as someone that just lost over and over again. What did you think of him having a little bit of a shot at becoming a, a, a bit of a star, given that the moniker of the Brooklyn Brawler associated Steve Lombardi. with Bobby? Steve Lombardi, the Brooklyn I didn't know who the hell the Brooklyn Brawler was, to tell you the truth. I mean, I booked him in my town, uh -huh. you know, but he was one of those plus others, you know? Yeah, right, right. And other stars. And Three so, other matches, yeah. yeah. And so all of the all of a sudden, here's the goat of wrestling manager managing the Brooklyn Brawler. And Bobby was able to make a believable character out of him. And it was that that rub, you know, you always you always in this business, you always you always want to get that rub. And uh, and uh and Steve, I mean, Steve probably with the right management and the right right ideals probably would have elevated himself into that because he was such a hard worker and such a student of the game. But then to have that guy standing over your shoulder that's considered the best manager of all time in our business, you're a can't miss for that position there. So he, he was able to elevate Steve into a, a credible character. Now there were a lot of rumors that you, you speak of Rob that uh, Steve got the opportunity because he had kind of a, a special relationship with Pat Patterson. Did you ever hear that? that well, I heard that, close. but I heard that, but I, I, you know, I, you know, you know, my feelings toward Pat Patterson, and I, and I, I've known Pat since I was a, you know, young man in this business, and I never knew Pat to get out of line in this business in in my entire career, and I, you know, I never saw any. Uh, 
I mean, even when I was around, when all this stuff was supposed to be taking place, either I was the blindest SOB <laughs> in the world, or I just didn't give a crap. But I give a crap about humanity, so I think I would have picked up on some of this stuff. And I think, I know, I don't think, I know I would have said something to somebody. But uh, Well, I'll say this. I think it's terrible that since we mentioned in our previous episode about how Pat passed, there's so many... Uh, slanderous stories that were put out by superstar Billy Graham that he later retracted. But, you know, they really put them out there. The internet always doesn't go back and correct everybody's correction. So there's a lot of information out there about Pat Patterson that, you know, you, I, you've heard things about the Terry Garvins and the Mel Phillips, but I had never heard in all the interviews we've ever done that Pat ever put anyone in that position. And I think it's a real shame that as he passed, there were people out there that believe a lot of that stuff that Billy made up. Well, unfortunately, we're a society of, of, of first impressions, you know, mm. that first impressions. And, and I, oh, this guy is a star, so what he's saying must be the truth, you know. Not to look inside of that, and why is he saying he's saying? Did mm -hmm. he have an issue with this problem and, and with this guy? And he certainly had an issue with Pat and the... And and Billy, I, I I can't speak for Billy, but I would I would venture to say yes, Billy. Today he regrets probably putting putting out a lot of that inaccurate information. So it wasn't right, but it happens it and happened. it happened. And you know, and and and, and the crap, Pat Patterson's credit, Pat was above all that. And you know, Pat, I mean, it, it was it, it got to be, I won't say hilarious because it's not hilarious, but. It was a, it was, it was, Pat, I would, I would get in these long conversations. Of, you know, you're in a car with a guy for a long time. You're driving up and down the highways. You can only talk wrestling so much. Right. You, can, you, know, you can talk wrestling, you can talk wrestling. And Pat loved to talk wrestling. We, we, we were fortunate because he was on from a, a different side of the country. He was out in California. So, there's a whole different set of wrestlers out there that I didn't know. I was here in, in, in Central America and Oklahoma and in Florida. Whole different set of wrestlers. Sure, a few of them crossed over. A few of them would go one side or the other side. But uh, as a whole, you didn't know everybody, you know. So we, we would sit in cars with this guy. Hey, was this story true about this? Was he really as crazy and all this stuff? So. Pat and I had a, a million conversations, so you, you kind of get to know you know people. So I would I would I would I would you know and Pat my later time on the road with Pat I, you know we're both looking. You know, Pat had quit quit probably twenty times. I, every time Pat would quit, <laughs> he said uh, he was retiring. Yeah. I said Pat, what your big screen TV breaks? They got to buy you another big screen TV, or you're retiring again. How many of these rocking chairs and big screen TVs can you put in that damn house of yours? You know, because I was always ribbing him. But uh, Pat, I said Pat, you know why don't you just you know because Pat loved on going on. I said, Pat, why don't you find you a partner? And go on these cruises, have a good time. Well, the boys, I said, Pat, you think nobody knows you're gay? <laughs> the whole damn world knows you're gay, Pat. You the, know, come the sky on, is you're, blue. you're you're the best cave. You're the only one cave favorite. You're the only one that knows that you are yeah, that thinks you're not gay. Everybody else knows you're gay, and there's nothing wrong with it. Be yourself. Have a good time. To hell with everybody. Huh? Oh, I just can't do it. I don't want to hurt this guy. I feel like you know what I mean. Pat was so sensitive to that. And then he and I were getting such big arguments over it. Pat, forget it. Forget it. They, these people ain't your friends anyway. They're going to hold it against you. Nobody cares. Everybody knows. But, but you know, people make up stories. And unless you go up and down a highway with somebody, you know, to me, all they were were stories because I, I've seen too many good instances of Pat being a, a, a stand up man to everybody. And you know what, after, and obviously 1992 is several years off from what we're discussing now, but who was the person that came back out of everyone that was involved with that? Pat Patterson. That so was the only one. WWF would not bring that man back if he was guilty of those accusations. Especially at that time, because it was so corporate, we were trying to be so yeah. corporate, trying to be a corporation at that time, trying to share that mom and pop, that... Uh, 
you know, uh, single ownership uh, 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 label and, and trying to go, go corporate and trying to get corporate sponsors. And so they, they were being squeaky clean. The drug testing at, at that yeah. time had evolved and, you know, everything about it. I'd moved up into the office at that time and I actually took Pat's place while he was on leave of absence yeah. and all that. So uh, I knew what was going on. And I knew Vince and Linda, especially Linda, would not allow that type of person back into this company if any of those accusations had any credence to them. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I think it's important to put it out there where there is a lot of, you know, stories that we just never corrected out there that are still online as we speak right now. But back to that big Saturday night's main event, Hulk Hogan uh, had a big match with Akeem. He went over, the Warrior retained the title over Honky Tonk Man, the man he dethroned back at SummerSlam the previous year. But an angle uh, that was kind of well-remembered from the show was when Brutus the Barber Beefcake shaved the head of outlaw Ron Bass. And that was pretty much almost, no, it wasn't the end, but almost near the end for the outlaw. What about Ron Bass didn't click, that he had such kind of a short, unmemorable run in the company? Ron Bass was a guy I, I personally brought in, up here. Did you? I, I brought him in from Florida. I remember talking to Vince. That he was frustrated with some of Dusty's bookings down here, and he was wanting to make the move. And so uh, I talked to Vince. Vince is a big cowboy. You, you got you'll you'll love him because you know you like characters, and mm -hmm. Ron, Ron was a great character. And so we brought him in, and he and he he had a nice run, and. He was probably on the verge of, of becoming a big star, but some guys, Dan, just aren't meant for seven days a week and flying 4,000 miles a week and, mm -hmm. uh, and the pressure on you. And uh, Ronnie was one of those good old country boys. He liked working the territory where, you know, he's in the same place all the time. And sometimes the, the travel life, isn't as glamorous as, as as you think it is or want it to be. And uh, and Ronnie, I don't think at a point after Ron reached that certain point and he kind of proved to himself I could do this thing. Plus, he was getting phone calls from Dusty again, you know, oh, really? apologize okay. and wanting him to come back and all that stuff. So I just think, uh, you know, it was just time for Ron to... Some guys just don't fit in, in, in the situation that we're in. And I saw a lot of them come and go guys that I thought were can't misses. And I, the other guys I thought didn't have a chance to make it. But uh, Ronnie was one of those can't miss it guys. He was a great talent. He is a great, he is a great talent. And was one of my longtime really dear friends. And a guy that would kick your butt at the drop at a hat. I know he invested, I believe it was a flower shop or something like that. Demolition invested in it heavily with him because they traveled an awful lot. I guess it didn't get off the ground the way they wanted to, but he had kind of the mind of an entrepreneur, too. Well, he, he, he did open a, up a flower shop, and it, no, it didn't really get off the ground. But in, in his later life down here, I mean, uh, when he was getting near the end of it, he knew, I mean, he was a very sharp businessman mm -hmm. and he was an entrepreneur and he opened up a, a nuts and bolts uh, shop, a hardware uh, oh, really? uh, 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 shop. He had a franchise. He would go around to places like Briscoe Brothers Body Shop. He'd go around to car dealerships. He'd go around to construction places f selling fasteners and nuts and bolts and everything he needed either for the industry of, of, of cars or our construction business. He, he had the fasteners that you need, and he was very successful at it and grew, grew his business into a statewide business. Good for him. It's nice to know that he did well after his wrestling career came to an end. Um, also in early 89, a man that we just kind of mentioned a minute ago, superstar Billy Graham was done. Uh, he couldn't wrestle anymore because his body was so dilapidated from the uh, the steroid abuse. They tried him as a commentator, and I don't think he could have used the word brother any more than he did. <coughs> did you think in early 1989, uh, superstar Billy Graham had anything left to contribute, or do you think maybe they tried uh, between managerial roles, wrestling and commentating, that it just wasn't going to work out at that point? 
Unfortunately, in 1989, I think for Billy Graham, it just, you know, his body had taken all that abuse. And I mean, people that know, uh, know the background of, uh, of Billy, Billy, I mean, you know, they see the, the New York superstar Billy Graham where all he did was hit those poses. But you go back in the history of superstar Billy Graham, he worked territories like San Francisco, where you had to be a worker, you had to be a bump taker. He came down here to Florida and worked with all of us guys down here where the work style down here was rough and tumble and kick ass, where you had to be a worker, you had to be a pretty good performer in the ring. And he goes from that up to uh, to New York where all he had to do was, was hit, hit yeah. that pose, hit and, pose. Uh, and brother and say something like that. but. Billy was very skilled, but the time had wore his body out. And when you're that muscular, and I'm certainly not, so I don't speak from experience. I just uh, speak from visualization of these guys that were built like that. And Hogan's a prime choice today. Hogan built the same. Hogan's having the same issues. You yeah, know? look at how his poor body fell so apart that's the gotta same take, way. that's got to take a toll on your body when you got those uh, 23 inch python and you're nailing them into the damn uh, hard ass ring every day when you're dropping those elbow drops or dropping that leg drop and that 300 some pounds so those guys that have those big bodies I mean I'm a little guy and I'm blessed I never had a lot of major injuries because I was you know I would say the RVD school but I'm a hell of a lot older than him but I got so I was doing them before him I always believe a good stretch and a good warm up and break a sweat before you went to the ring. I'd always be in the back, like it would be right back there, Bobby back and would be stretching. We'd be doing stair mats. We'd be doing something to stretch our body out because we weren't big guys. So when we went out there, those big guys, and they decided they wanted to pull us from one end of the ring to the other, we had that flexibility in us. And I never really got a lot of serious injuries, knock on wood. So, man, I believe it was for my stretching and them. When you got those big old drawn in muscles like uh, Superstar had, it's hard to stretch those things out where you can do it. I remember trying to put a hammer lock on Billy and I couldn't get the damn arm up. Really? Because you know, he was that, that muscle bound and that wow. tight. So, But you know, the other guys that, that didn't have those big thick muscles, you could get those arm bars on them. And, but uh, I just think it caught up with Billy and I think it was, you know, you tried too many things with him and people were, Wanted to see superstar Billy Graham. They didn't want to see an announcer. The 70s Billy Graham was done in they 1989. Done. That's for sure. And, you know, I think that resentment is what led to him stirring the pot, so to speak, a couple of years later when everything started to hit the fan and he went out publicly attacking the company and such. Uh, and that's too bad because... A lot of people just have a hard time letting that stardom go. And I think, I mean, Billy's not the first one, but, you know, it, uh, and he definitely wasn't the last one, no, as no. we saw. <laughs> but he was, a, he, he was one, of the, one of the beginnings with, with the WWFE that started it, and it continued to roll. But uh, you're going to have your disagreements, and, uh, and that, that's something that just wasn't with this company. You see, our guys left the, 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 the other company. Oh, WC. sure, sure. And back in my day, even in the territorial days, there'd be a guy left, leave Florida and go, man, oh, you can't go down to Florida with Briscoe and Rhodes and Graham. They've they got all the spots down there. They, they'll kill you. I mean, I've heard, I've heard how many guys I've backstabbed and all that stuff. And hell, all we did... As a promoter, you get a guy that can draw you money. You're gonna let him draw you money. <laughs> the hell with you. I mean, you know, you'll stick that guy in there. Give me a break and let him draw the damn money. Let him do the damn work for right. a while. So holding back guys is just uh, just a raster figment of their imagination. We got a hell of imagination too. So. Well, just a shame because you know. It's too bad that WWE at that point, early on in the, it really was early on in the company, 89, Vince and Linda McMahon were only about seven or so years in as far as ownership goes. They didn't have legends programs and ambassador programs. We didn't have the money. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it it certainly was a different world, but uh, I had some very unique dealings with Billy later on in life that 
Uh, I could tell you about that were both the interesting, fun, and disastrous. But mm -hmm. again, he's a kind of a unique personality, as I'm sure you know. Well, maybe we'll get there down the road, but I'm getting the cue from the back. We're running out of time here again. This episode just flew by. We've landed about now about two and a half weeks into 1989. So we got a long way to go, Jerry. I mean, you might have to tell Barbara you got to relocate up to Boston for a little bit. Either that or we're going to As long as you can get me into Fenway Park, I don't care. Have you ever been? No. Would you like Not to go? Not for a ball game. I've never been for a ball game. I've been to Fenway Park, but never for a ball game. Would you like to go? I'd love to, yeah. You know what? we got to make that happen. As I mentioned, this is the day we're taping this. We're you know, going Billy, to a Billy, race game. Uh, Billy, what to be, Bean or whatever his name is? Some executive. Oh, Billy Bean. He's with Oakland, though, isn't he? Oh, he, he when he's back, I thought he was a special uh, special assignment guy for the... Now that you mention that, I think he might have something to do with the ownership group. He now. does. He does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. met him on an airplane. He's a big fan, and he said, anytime you want an inside tour of uh, Fenway Park, just give me... I think I still got his business card. Really? Yeah. Well, what the... <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to make sure you come up in the summertime then with that. Mm -hmm. All right, wrestling fans, again, it was a pleasure to have this great Hall of Famer with us. We look forward to producing much more great content, both here in this beautiful wrestle house in Tampa, Florida, overlooking the ocean as the sun begins to set to our left. Smell that breeze coming off I that go. Jerry, you're going to get goodness. me to want to move down here, brother. We're running out of time. If you're in the premiere chat, let us know what you thought of the episode. The Super Chat is open, as well as the Patreon. If you want to help keep wrestling legends working, get early access to Wrestling Insiders, the show itself, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library that's been seen by millions online, millions more on the Howard Stern Show, Patreon exclusives, and again, make sure these guys, some of the great legends of this sport that haven't done as well as Jerry Post Life, let's keep them working during the worst of times during Corona. For my friend Jerry Briscoe, I'm Dan Marotti. We'll see you soon on Wrestling Insiders. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Please give the video a big thumbs up. Leave us a comment and subscribe to the channel to enjoy more great content. Don't forget, you can help keep wrestling legends working. Check out our eBay store and join the Boston Wrestling family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling so we can produce more in-depth shoot interviews.